My name is Sam Mihara. I'm a uh, survivor of this camp. Um, I was a child, age uh, nine, when I went in. And came out age 12, so I was here for three years. I developed this presentation because a group of uh, Department of Justice attorneys asked me to come and speak at a conference. And uh, I didn't know anything about Korematsu and, and uh, Endo cases. Uh, but uh, I know a lot about what I remember in camp. So I said, uh, oh, I'm going to make a story about what I remember in the camp. But I'd better be ready. So I studied Korematsu, I studied Endo, and I talked to the lawyers who you know, presented the cases. Uh, uh, and um, I, I was really ready, and I went up and and I started my talk with uh, three questions just to calibrate. I want to calibrate the audience. A bunch of 100 lawyers. The first question, how many of you have heard there were 120,000 of us that were removed from our homes, and most of us are American citizens placed in a prison camp for three years? And uh, about a third of the audience, raise your hand. The majority had never heard of it. Second question was, how many of you have heard the name Korematsu, Fred Korematsu? And you know, there's a, a sea of a hundred lawyers and the three young kids in the back raise their hands. Ninety-seven percent never heard of Korematsu. And uh, the third question was, how many of you heard of Mitsuo Endo? Nobody, nobody heard of Mitsuo Endo. So I said, oh, this is. This is easy. These people almost know almost nothing. <laughs> and so I did my, my, my story, and uh, it was over, and they gave me a nice applause. And then I found out the lead attorney in the group got on his, tele on his uh, computer, and he sent out a message to all 50 U.S. attorneys in the country and said, you got to hear Sam talk. And uh, after that, I was speaking at DOJ offices all over the country, D.C., San Francisco, Los Angeles. So that's how I started. And I kept working on my, on my presentation. And so what you're going to hear today is similar to the one I presented annually at UCLA and at Harvard and Columbia. Um, for the law offices and law schools, it's a little bit more detailed on the two cases. But this is more for a general audience, uh, uh, mostly adult. And uh, so I think, I, I hope you'll enjoy it. And I call it my personal memories of Art Mountain. Uh, President Bush made a speech about a few years ago, and, and this was at the dedication of the uh, African American National Museum in D.C. And, and his first sentence in his opening speech went like this. Go ahead and play that. Great nation does not hide its history. It faces its flaws and corrects them. A great nation does not hide history. I love that statement. And, and that's been my lead statement because so many people in this country don't know what really happened uh, because it hasn't been told. And so that's my mission is to tell the story of what really happened next. The problem began a long time ago before I was born. And back in the 1800s, we saw these kinds of political cartoons. Here's a, an Asian with a bloody knife and a smoking gun and standing over this woman he just killed. And the caption, Yo, terror threatens white women. That clearly made the impression that Asians are dangerous. And, and uh, you know, that went up in the, in the late 1800s. And, and that's, that's the evidence of the kind of hate that developed against all Asians. You know, not uniquely Japanese, but, but all Asians. Next year. Let me introduce you to my family, that uh, defiant brat with a folded arms, that's me. I was about uh, eight years old in this photograph. That's a Mihara family. My brother next to me, uh, my father standing behind me, and my mother standing to the right. Grandpa and grandma are seated. The pit photo was taken around 1940. We, we moved into a beautiful house. My father was very successful. It turns out my, my grandparents in Japan knew the importance of getting a good education so they can get a better life. And so um, uh, Grandpa and Grandma worked hard and sent my father to a, a college in Japan called Waseda University. It's very, very prestigious, very comparable to Harvard. And he majored in English. And so here he's really good in English, and of course he's good in Japanese. As a result, uh, uh, he, after graduation, uh, he found a job in San Francisco. 
working for a bilingual newspaper. And he was a writer of English articles in the Japanese American newspaper. And that's how he started his career. And he met my mother there and they got married. And was, uh, I was born, my brother was born. We are American citizens by birth. And uh, always have been and hopefully always will be. Uh, so this is a story about the Mihara family and what we went through during those difficult times. After Pearl Harbor, December 7th, life became very difficult for people of Japanese ancestry. Next year, we were you know, bombarded with these kinds of political ads. Here's a, a Japanese soldier with a bloodied knife and a Nazi German soldier with his weapon. And the caption says, our homes are in danger. That really means it's the people living in this country who are of Japanese or German ancestry who are the real problems. And that's the purpose of this, this ad, of this political cartoon, is spread the hysteria among the people that Japanese and Germans are dangerous. Next chart. Roosevelt made many good decisions. I have to give, give him credit. He made many good decisions. But he made a huge mistake on what to do about Japanese, Germans, and Italians in this country. He simply said, I defer to my military advisors. And the military advisors recommended to Roosevelt that he sign an executive order called 9066. And that order is very simple. It doesn't say Japanese, Germans, and Italians. It simply says the military has the power to remove anyone. They can remove anyone. And then he signed it. Very important date, February 19, 1942. And so, uh, the military now had this power of removing people. Well, who are the military in this country at that time? Next chart. I'm oh, sorry. Roosevelt had two staff types. One is the Department of Justice type on the right, and the War Department or Defense Department on the left. On the right, the DOJ people, including the Attorney General, even down to the head of FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, they all said, don't do it. Hoover did all the studies to confirm that there's no reason to do it, because he's already locked up the, quote, risky Japanese and Germans. So the DOJ recommended don't do it. But it turns out on the military side, headed by Stinson, who was a very senior political uh, leader, he, w he was outranking <laughs> the DOJ people because of his seniority, and he convinced them uh, the president to follow his recommendation. And that's why the decision was made on the military side rather than on the Department of Justice side. The fellow on the very bottom, military attorney, Major Carl Ben Detson, he played a major role. He wrote the words on Executive 9066. He made decisions as to who should go in and so forth. I'll talk a little bit more about uh, Ben Detson in a moment. Next chart. So this is the military districts of the U.S. at that time. There were five districts. Uh, Eastern, headed by General Drum, a Central, a Southern uh, District, a Western District, and out in the Pacific, uh, a, a Pacific Command, in, and in, that included Hawaii, the island of Hawaii. It turns out General Drum faced the issue, and he decided not to remove any Germans, Japanese, or Italians. Similarly, in the Central and the Southern Command, and out in the Pacific, which included Hawaiian Islands, those four generals said, we're not going to do it. There's no need. One reason being the industry complained. They said, you know, if you take away my workers, I can't produce. But most important, General Emmons made the statement, I cannot do that because it's unconstitutional. The only general who stood up for the Constitution. Interesting. So four out of the five generals decided not to remove people of Japanese, German, and, and Italian. DeWitt was totally different. He hated Japanese. He didn't hate Germans and Italians, but he hated Japanese. And he ordered everyone of Japanese ancestry along the West Coast to be removed. That's the source. That's the person who was responsible for our imprisonment during that time. So what's the evidence today that De DeWitt has such hate? Well, this next photo will convince you. Next year. These are kids who had mixed parents. 
General DeWitt found them in orphanages. In those days, it was popular to raise uh, children of mixed parents in orphanages. And, and DeWitt and Ben Detson found these kids inside orphanages in LA, San Francisco, Seattle. And, and uh, they ordered these kids. Look at the third row of their babies being held by guardians, Japanese guardians. So, so DeWitt ordered them to the prison. This picture was taken at Mansonar Camp in California. Very, very important photographic evidence of the hate that DeWitt had. So, you know, there's no question about the, the, um, the severity of, of his hate uh, against the people of Japanese ancestry. Next chart. There was a famous photographer in those days, a lady named Dorothea Lang. How many of you recognize this photo of the, of the migrant mother? How many of you do? Uh, Dorothea was really good at taking pictures of people. And uh, during the early 30s, during the Great Depression, uh, she was asked by the government to go to uh, the farm country in Central California and start taking pictures of, of, uh, of farm workers. And her skill is to take pictures of people that shows emotional condition. And you can, you know, you don't need words. You can tell that this mother is having trouble. It turns out she had trouble getting food on the table for the kids. And so that's the picture that made her famous about how to take pictures of people. But with that experience, the government after Pearl Harbor said, uh, we want you to go to San Francisco and start taking pictures of Japanese people in the process of our removing them. But do not take embarrassing photos. Don't take pictures of armed guards forcing people out of homes and into, into <coughs> trains and buses. Uh, because that's embarrassing. So Dorothea found out it doesn't take orders. She takes pictures she thinks will be historically important. And when the government found out what she did, they impounded thousands of her photos in the, in the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley until we were finally released and we saw pictures you're going to see in a moment. Next chart. The first set of pictures Dorothea took was my neighborhood. She came to San Francisco to my grammar school. This is a Raphael Will Grammar School about uh, two blocks from my house in uh, Japantown in San Francisco. And uh, look at the, the kids. Uh, these are my buddies in the fourth grade. Uh, you know, look at their complexions. We were diversified well before it was popular and, and we had no trouble. The only problem we had was they don't know how to pronounce our names. <laughs> <laughs> and they're going to strike t-shirt especially. He went by the name of Hisashi Kobayashi. Okay, now, these other kids don't know how to pronounce it. So we all figured out we will rename ourselves easier to pronounce names. And in this case, Hisashi called himself Kobe, like a basketball player. So we knew Kobe uh, as Kobe forever. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. That's him in the striped t shirt uh, as, uh, as Kobe, Kobayashi. Next chart. Here's some more buddies of mine. Uh, in the second row, these are uh, Japanese American, Nisei. The guy in the middle went by the name of Katsutoshi Ito. Now, all of you probably heard of an Ito in your lifetime, but you probably never heard the word Katsutoshi. And his father realized that was an awful mistake. And so for his father renamed him, and he became known as Willie Ito. And I'm gonna talk about Willie in a moment. He's been my buddy forever. So uh, uh, let's go to the next chart. The most famous photograph that Dorothea took is this one here. It's a group of second grade, seven-year-old girls doing their morning Pledge of Allegiance. And, and what's, uh, what's interesting, look at the facial expressions. You know, when these girls give that pledge, you know, I pledge allegiance, you can sense they're trying to show that uh, emotionally they want to show their loyalty to the United States of America. It's a very, very significant, and that photo's been used in lots of museums and books. I'm going to talk a little bit more about one of these girls in a moment. But uh, all of you know there's an important phrase in the pledge. Let's look at the next chart. And that is the phrase, with liberty and justice for all. And when an armed guard comes to your house and removes you, puts you on a train to send you to prison, you've lost liberty and you've lost justice because there was none. So that was the basis of our main complaint after this was over. And I'll talk a little bit more about that next chart. So Dorothea kept taking more pictures. Here's a headline of a newspaper in, in our uh, neighborhood. And it said, ouster of all, and then the J word, and California's near. So the media is creating the hysteria among the readers and try to motivate them 
to have the government remove us. So the media was doing a huge disfavor by spreading hysteria. Next chart. This billboard went up a half a block from my house in the middle of Japantown. I lived on Sutter Street near Buchanan. Those of you who mm -hmm. are familiar with San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the next corner, which is Sutter Street and Laguna, this billboard went up, you know, bye bye, and then the J word. Awful. I mean, how would you like it if a billboard went up near your house and said bye bye, whatever your racial, your religious group affiliation is? That, that'd be awful. But it happened in 1942 in San Francisco. Terrible, huge billboard. Next year. So we started seeing these signs, and it gave us uh, these orders were plastered in front of our houses, the post, lamp posts and, and walls, and it, it gave us one week from the time they posted these signs to move. In that one week, we had to do everything needed for the move. Next chart. We had to sell or store all our property because they, we could not take uh, large pieces. All we could carry is a hand carry with us to the, to the uh, prison. Only hand carry luggage was allowed. And that was signed, next chart. By, uh, oh, we had to report to a particular station where the buses came to pick us up and that took us to the train. And that was signed by DeWitt. And if, if, if you violated these rules, you are in violation of a federal law. That's how strong of a, um, of a situation was. Then we had a bunch of other things. Uh, confiscation of radios and knives and so forth. Our bank accounts were frozen, and then we were told then to get on the buses, and they never told us where we, where we were going. A very, very difficult environment when we left. Next chart. Here's a typical family called Mochita family, and uh, they're now getting ready for the move, and the kids are wearing dog tags. I remember my tag. It had my name. It had my prisoner number. I had a number assigned by the government, and it gave the first destination. And that's how they kept the, the kids uh, from straying away from the proper uh, transportation to get to the prisons. Next chart. This is probably the most damaging photo that Dorothea took. It shows the armed guards body searching an elderly lady, and behind that lady is a small child also being searched for weapons before they get on the bus and take us to the prison. Notice the word on the originals that impounded. That's one of the examples of the photos the government really hated, and that's what uh, resulted in all of her photos then being uh, put away at the Bancroft Library for a long time. Now, sir, there are two, there are three people who, who resisted going. One of them is Fred Korematsu, and I'm not going to go into a lot of details about Fred. It's really an interesting story, but in a nutshell, Fred had an Italian white girlfriend, and they had plans. They wanted to get married, they wanted to stay in the area, they didn't want to go to the camps. So Fred decided to get plastic surgery on his face. And he found a surgeon in San Francisco and ordered him, make me look white. Now the picture on the left is before surgery, the picture on the right is after surgery. He still looks Japanese. <laughs> a terrible job. <laughs> and he spent all his money on this surgeon. You know, and if I were him, I would have asked my money back, but no, my friend gave away all his money. So he had to get another job in order to help pay to get married, because they couldn't marry in California. And that's when he got caught, because he needed to get money. He went looking for a new job, a new employer found him. Found him guilty. A uh, case went up to uh, Supreme Court. Supreme Court decided six to three. Six to three, majority rule, that he's still guilty. And the reason, the main reason is he is capable of espionage. Not that he did it, not that there's an evidence, because he's Japanese, he's capable. One of the worst decisions made by the Supreme Court. And so as a result, uh, Korowatsu went to prison and then it was transferred over to a regular uh, uh, WRA camp. And so he spent the war years uh, in being in prison next year. So the trains came and picked us up. Uh, at, well, we went the buses to the train station. The trains now are, are uh, shoulder to shoulder, protected by these guards, make sure we don't escape. And um, families then getting ready uh, for the big move. Our first move was to a temporary camp. In my case, we went to one in Pomona, California, Southern California, uh, a state fairgrounds was converted to a, a prison camp. 
Uh, many others went to horse race tracks, which were converted uh, into um, prison camps, a temporary. And we were held there for three years. And after that, we, then we were taken to our permanent camps. Similar train, similar guards. And I remember that train ride for three years. I'm sorry, for three, uh, three long days, days and nights on that train until we got to Hart Mountain. Next chart. Uh, here's a map of all the chart, uh, all the camps in, in the uh, U.S. at the time. The little dots on the left are the uh, temporary camps in California. Uh, the large triangles are the family camps. There are ten of them, Hart Mountain in, uh, in the middle, uh, Idaho, there's one in Utah, one in Colorado, two in Arkansas, two in southern Arizona, and two on the eastern slopes of the Sierras in California. They held an average of 10,000. Tule Lake was the biggest. They held up to 18,000 people. Um, and I don't have time today to go into details about the people at uh, Tule Lake, but, but uh, there was a reason for that. The government suspected these people who were assigned to Tule Lake uh, were not loyal to the United States. Uh, but regardless, uh, uh, most of the camps were of the size uh, that we had here at Hart Mountain. Next year. So where is Hart Mountain? Well, I don't have to tell you where Hart Mountain is because you now know. But most of the audiences I speak to never heard of Hart Mountain. They never heard of, of uh, northern, uh, northern Wyoming. And I would explain to them, if you went to Yellowstone, you go east about 50 miles to come across the town of Cody. At that time, it had about 2,000 people. Uh, the town of Powell had about 1,000 people. And Hart Mountain is exactly halfway between Cody mm -hmm. and Powell. So we were about 15 miles from the town of Cody. So I wondered what, what the people of Cody really thought when they heard we were coming. So let's go next chart. I found this newspaper headline in the Cody Enterprise. It said 10,000 in the J word are to be interned here. That's a key word. The casual reader says, oh, they're coming to Cody. And so that, again, the, the, the hysteria was developed by the local media. And the people demanded that the prison be made secure. So it's the people, especially the local people around these camps who demanded high security. And so the plan originally was, you know, no, no uh, security guards, no towers, uh, just a, a location where people will reside. But no, the local people demanded it be made into a prison. And so it's kind of interesting. It's the federal government who ordered us out from the homes but it's the local people who demanded it be made into a secure facility. And the president, I'll talk about that a little bit later, the president gave an apology, but the local, uh, local leadership never apologized for that role. And we'll remember that next year. Ellen Simpson, uh, interesting fellow. Um, Ellen was a friend of ours. And uh, he was a teenager during those days. Uh, the, the Simpson family were raised in, in Cody, right here. They, they still do uh, live here. And uh, Ellen remembers, because as a teenager, he remembers what the people of Cody thought. And so he made a video of what the people of Cody thought. So let's play this. I should, should, should come up on the next chart. Hit it one more time. So then we were told there were 11,000 people there. Well. There are only two cities larger than that in Wyoming, that was Cheyenne and Casper. Powell was about 2,500, Cody probably 3,500, and so people thought, now if those people escape, we'll all be killed. So there's 11,000 of them there, and they're going to break out, and they'll come to town, and they'll be dead. The madness, the people of Cody thought we're going to come into town with our bare hands and strangle them. I call it a kamikaze attack on the innocent town of Cody. But that's what the people of Cody thought. Madness. But that's an example of what hysteria can do in that situation. Again, driven by the media. Okay, next chart. Here's a plan for the Harkon facility, big facility. Um, 30 blocks, each block had 24 barracks. Uh, each barrack held up to 25 people. Very, very concentrated facility. Um, when, uh, by the way, you're located at, uh, uh, you will be tomorrow located at uh, where it says Army Barracks. That's the area where the uh, facility is uh, that you'll be visiting tomorrow. Uh, and those are the railroad tracks you'll cross when you get off the main highway. 
the same railroad tracks that we came on uh, when we arrived here. Uh, if you go up the, the road uh, next to the uh, Army barracks, uh, you'll come across uh, what remains of the facility. I'll be at the hospital giving tours at the hospital. Uh, down on the lower left, uh, it's, it's not on this uh, uh, scene, but there is a um, uh, root cellars uh, right next to where the warehouse sign is. Um, and where the area is called the post office and the dry goods and administration building, that's the memorial uh, section. Uh, so those are the areas that remain today. There were plans to build three schools, and uh, when we got there, the high school was almost finished, but they never started on the grammar school. And we asked why, and the answer came back that local people demanded stop building schools because we who are not prisoners don't get new schools. Why are you building new schools for prisoners? <laughs> so the government was convinced. So they stopped no more grammar schools. And we had to convert some of the barracks into grammar schools. That meant forcing people out of those barracks and, and, and putting them into other barracks that were already crowded. So that's what led up to the, the massive concentration of the people in the barracks. Uh, the government hired many workers, uh, mostly carpenters, to come and build the facilities, some 2,000 workers from all over the country. And uh, what, the reason for carpenters, it was all made of wood, the very little concrete work. And so that's why these carpenters came and built it next year. So here's what it looked like when I arrived. That's Heart Mountain in the background. It's kind of shaped like a heart. That's where it got its name. On the left, you see part of the 450 barracks. They're covered with tar paper. That's why they look bar uh, black in all of the photographs uh, of the camp. On the right side, there's the barbed bar fence. There's a guard tower. If you look on the top of the hill in the background, there's another guard tower. And there are nine of these guard towers surrounding the entire uh, facility. And when I got there, I remember there was a sentry in each of the towers with a weapon next to it. So when we got there, the government gave us two numbers. Everyone got a unique number. The first number is my room or cell number. 14 is my block number. 12, a 22 is my barrack number, 22 out of 24. And C is the middle room inside the barrack. So that's how we got to know where we are. We had to remember they're all identical. If you don't know your own number, uh, that's how we remember our address. Whenever I see somebody from another uh, from, from, who said they were from Heart Mountain. Our first question always is, what block were you in? So that's, that's easy to remember, 14 is my block, and, uh, and that's how we do it. The second number is my prisoner number, 26737D. Today, it still exists. There's a file on every one of the 120,000 people in the National Archives in Washington. And anyone who is a relative or who has a need to know can get a copy of every piece of paper that was generated at the camp. And any of you who know of anyone who might have been in the camp or be a relative, uh, contact me. I can tell you how to get a copy of your records. The government, you fill out a form, the government sends you a CD with every piece of paper. And you may not want to know about, especially about the medical history. It also has my grammar school grades, and you're not going to see those. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it has it, every piece of paper, I swear. We had, each of us, we can order a CD of what's in there. Next, sir. So here are more details of the security system. There's a guard with a 30 caliber rifle on top of the guard tower. In the middle of the guard tower details, the floodlights were lighting up the camp at night. And on the right side, there were signs along the fence, and it said, stop. You know, People of Japanese ancestry, there's a guard on duty with orders to shoot if you try to escape. That's the system they had used to make sure we don't escape. And there was not, not a single escape from Heart Mountain, with a few minor exceptions. If somebody asked the question, who escaped at the end of the talk, all right? Anyway, so that was the security system. Next chart. So here's the details of the barracks. Uh, there were six rooms in each barrack. The end ones were the smallest. Next to the end ones were the biggest for like families of up to seven people. And the middle ones were for average middle, middle size, like my family. So my brother, myself, my two parents, four of us, inside a room, 20 feet by 20 feet for our entire duration. And I remember when I went into that room, 
there were four cots, military cots, and if you laid them out, stretched out, ready for bed, very little room for anything else. There was a uh, pot-bellied stove that burns coal for the winter, uh, but inside the surface, there was no drywall, no inner wall. There, there, they had a material called cellotex they gave us later on in our stay, but when we got there, it was just the bare inside surface of the outside siding. And we saw some strange things like autographs by the carpenters written on the inside surface. Very depressing, but it was a storage shed. That's where we were when we got there. No electricity, no running water. We had a single light bulb in the ceiling, and that was it. Next chart. Here's a picture of my family in front of the barrack. That's me in a white shirt, my brother in the sweater, my mother standing on the left, her three sisters in the middle, and my uncle on the right. This is right in front of our barrack, barrack 14, uh, block 14, barrack 22. Next. The toilets were embarrassing. Uh, if you can imagine 10 toilet bowls, not, not seats, bowls, and uh, no partitions. And when, after meals, especially after breakfast, there'll be a line of maybe up to 100 people waiting. And uh, if you're lucky, you got a seat, you got a bowl. And you sat down, you know something strange. When it came time, there are nine faces looking at you <laughs> while you're doing your business. That was, you know, but there was no choice. You either did it or you didn't do it, and we learned how to do it and, uh, because of the no partition. Uh, I've been told that women had, on the women's side, they built some partitions, but uh, I, I swear it, that's what it looked like on the men's side. Next chart. At the, tar at the start, we had some food on the table that served in mess halls, like this photograph shows there's bread on the table, and uh, on the plate with a kid looking at you, there was potatoes, and uh, the mother's eating a plate of pickled vegetables. Inside the pitcher, there was powdered milk, and I've sworn out powdered milk for the last 70 years, because I remember that mm -hmm. awful taste. But that's the kind of food they gave us to start. And we were, we were devastated. We wanted what we liked to eat. Fresh veggies, we like rice, we like fish, we like protein, milk, whole milk, and, and, and eggs. So our, the farmers in our camp converted the uh, land just outside the camp into f productive farms. It took a year of hard work. Part of that effort was to create the root cellars that uh, you all should go look at. Fascinating facility. And uh, that's what held, uh, held our vegetables uh, for our winter feeding. After, because the season for growing was so short, we had to have food during the winter, and that's what we used, these large root cellars. Next chart. The winters were miserable. That first winter, it got down to minus 28 degrees, mm -hmm. minus 28. And, and, you know, the inhumane situation was the government never told us we were coming to our mountain. So we were wearing California clothing when we came here and uh, we had to go to grammar school several blocks away in minus 28 degree weather with a horizontal blowing snow a blizzard and uh, that was not easy next year we had a hospital by name it was a hospital all it was was more barracks there were 17 barracks connected with a corridor and if any of you come on the tour, I'll explain more details about the design of the hospital. But um, our family had a lot of trouble medically. To make it short, my father had a case of glaucoma of his eyes. And he had it since college in Japan, um, early phases of glaucoma. And when he came to San Francisco, he found a specialist, a special ophthalmologist, eye surgeon, who knew how to take care of glaucoma. Because in those days, there was no medication like they have today. And so it took a really skilled um, a practitioner to take care of it. And he was able to see, I remember, he was able to see until he came to camp. And once he came to camp, there was no medical people who knew how to take care of glaucoma. No one. They were mostly general practitioners. You know, we had babies delivered, we had broken bones mended, we had tonsillitis taken care of but no one knew how to take care of glaucoma. General DeWitt would not let him go back. So as a result, my father went blind next year. 
he never saw again once he entered into Hartmill. And that was an economic disaster for our family because Dad had to figure out how to get income while he was blind. So that was a, a, a very, very difficult time in our family. Next chart. But that wasn't the worst in our family medically, and that was Grandpa. Grandpa died here at camp. He died in that hospital, you'll be able to see. We had a funeral for Grandpa, and a picture was taken. The funeral was inside the barrack, and that's me in a white shirt, my father next to me, and Grandma in a veil. And I thought something was strange, because I went to the hospital to see Grandpa over a span of three months, and his body turned into skin and bones. He looked like a Holocaust survivor. He looked horrible, and he passed away. Um, a few years ago, I wondered what really happened to Grandpa. So I ordered his medical records, and I started reading, and I could not believe what the doctors were doing. They prescribed a new process of starving the cancer out of his system. They suspected he may have colon cancer. So they restricted his diet. Didn't, he was hungry. He kept asking for food. They did not give him intravenous feeding to try to keep nutrition in the system. In fact, the record showed they were giving him a laxative for cancer. So that told me a lot about the quality of medical care. It just wasn't there in these conditions in a prison. And the bottom line, of course, is you know, in these kind of prison conditions, it's humane to have reasonable medical care. And I think places like Heart Mountain and other camps did not have that quality. That's the one complaint I have about what the system they used at the time. Next chart. At the very end, the government finally decided to let a few of us go to downtown Cody. This is a picture of Sheridan Avenue in Cody. I remember taking my father and escorting him along Sheridan Avenue and going to each store. And um, I would describe, here's a shoe store, here's the restaurant, and so forth. About every third store, one third of the store had that awful sign. And that's where I learned the significance of racial hatred. The people in this area, after several years of our being here, not causing any problems, they still hated us so much they wouldn't want us in their stores. And so that was a, a difficult time, and I'll, I'll never forget that. Next chart. At the very end, there was a, I call him a hero white attorney. His name is James Purcell. That's him on the left. And uh, Purcell was a civil rights uh, attorney in San Francisco. And he knew the conditions at the camp. He went to Tanferan and he saw people living in horse stalls. And he said, I'm going to do something about this because that is really inhumane. He found a lawsuit and he found this lady named Mitsuo Endo in the camp. She's a little bit older than me. She was working as a secretary at the DMV in California. And she was a perfectly model loyal citizen. She did exactly what DeWitt told her to do. She's never been to Japan, never associated with the Japanese societies. Uh, and, and, and literally a model American citizen. And so Purcell filed a lawsuit. You cannot hold a person with such loyalty to this country because it's unconstitutional. And the Supreme Court unanimously, nine to zero, decided that's correct. Told the government, let her go. And the government should let everyone who's considered loyal, let them go, go back home. That's the case that woke up in the doors, let us out. Not many people know that, but uh, Korematsu is famous, but Endo gets the credit for the attorney who made sure that we were released before the end of the war. Next chart. So we got on the trains to take us home. The guards have all gone home by this time, and the government decided to destroy the camp. Next chart. What they did was they took all 450 barracks, and they held a lottery for returning veterans and, and uh, with, with $1, if you win the lottery, you pay $1, you can get a barrack. And they got rid of all 450 barracks that way, and they were moved out, away. And most of them were used for storage, some were converted to homes, beautiful homes, I've seen a couple, but they're scattered around this area, northern Wyoming, southern Montana. 
and we're in the process of identifying whatever is left that might be reasonable to, to mm -hmm. have. And we brought the first barrack back about a year ago, and it's called a shell barrack. It's from, from Shell, Wyoming. And be sure to look inside. It's really, really accurate and original. But that's the condition of the barrack that we found. And we're trying to bring, we know where more are, and we're trying to bring them all back to help recreate the camp. When we got home, life was worse than when we left, and the hatred kept building up. We were greeted by these kinds of signs, you know, don't, don't come back here, this is not your neighborhood. And, uh, and we had trouble getting jobs and, and finding housing. Uh, but there was a friend of mine who had a really difficult time. Uh, and uh, let's go to the next chart. Her name is Toshi Ito, Toshi Ito. And Toshi had a father uh, who was a Nisei, a Japanese American. His uh, skill was in selling insurance. He had a license before the war to sell insurance in San Jose. And uh, after the war, he went back, and the insurance company would not give him a license because he was Japanese. And he couldn't find any other job. And so what Toshi's father did was really, really, an, a, a difficult decision. I'll let her explain what her father did, which is to commit suicide. Now let's watch this film. I went to his bed and on the side he slept and I just lay there and I cried and I could smell his hair tonic that he wore and uh, I never cried so much in my life. Very sad. Uh, Toshi passed away a couple of years ago, but while she was living, she joined me and we went touring, giving t uh, speeches, and uh, she wanted everyone to know. That's why she did the film. Want everyone to know what, what hatred could do. It gets so bad. Uh, and, and you heard uh, uh, Donna talk yesterday about the impact of, uh, not, not all of you were there, but about the impact of uh, passing on the second, third generation about the uh, hatred, that it has a huge impact, and it certainly did uh, in her case. Next chart. At the very end, we wanted to do something that was important to us, and that was called a redress program, and we had three objectives in this program. Next. The first is to restore our civil rights, because on, at the end of 1944, the books were still there, the laws were available for the military to remove anyone. And so we want our civil rights back. The next is to get an apology. Very simple. We wanted a leader, a responsible leader of the country to give us an apology. And the third point is we get some money, some compensation for the damages that took place. And that took 50 years of effort by a large team of Japanese American attorneys working on Congress, working on the White House, trying to get these things done. Next chart. One of the steps in that process was an exhibit at the Smithsonian in Washington. And at the outside of the exhibit, it featured the poster girl, uh, Dorothy Lange's uh, famous image of uh, the uh, second grade girls doing the Pledge of Allegiance. And inside the exhibit, there were photos like this next one. And this is the Masuda family. And the Masuda family lives near close to me, near, uh, near Huntington Beach. And uh, there's Sergeant Masuda in uniform. He came to say goodbye to the whole family who was inside a prison at the time. And after the picture was taken, he was shipped off to Italy. And he fought for this country. And he died fighting for this country. And at the same time that he died, the family was still inside the prison created by the same government. So that photo was sent to the White House, got to the attention no less than President Ronald Reagan. And Reagan remembered, because he was at the memorial service as an army captain at the time when uh, Sergeant Masuda passed away. And he remembered, fortunately. So Reagan decided, I'm going to sign the bill. So very, very important. Next chart. Here's Reagan signing the bill called the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. So here we are, almost uh, you know, 50 years after it happened. Reagan finally signing the bill. Next chart. George Bush, the first George Bush, he sent me a letter 
and it had in the letter the words, sincere apology. And the letter also had a small check that helped pay for the damages. So that was a very nice gesture. Last year, President Joe Biden made a speech and a written statement, I quote, Today, we reaffirm the federal government's apology to the Japanese Americans. Very nice. So here we have three presidents in our country have now expressed apology. So that goes a long, long way to help mend what happened in those days. Next chart. Heart Mountain today, all of you know, it's a beautiful mountain. It's still there. Next chart. We built this facility, and, and you'll see it tomorrow, uh, called the Learning Center. The outside looks like barracks. Inside looks like a series of schoolrooms. Next chart. On the upper left are the, uh, the display areas. You'll see that on your tour tomorrow. On the upper right, we bring in school kids. Uh, this is a group of high school kids came in from Montana, and uh, all year round, we operate uh, uh, the school kids to come in on a day trip and uh, teach them what happened. On the lower left are our teachers, high school teachers. We have a grant from the government to uh, select uh, applicants to come to uh, Heart Mountain, and they're paid like a, a, a regular paid uh, uh, college education program. And so when they leave after one week of intensive, uh, intensive training, they now are, are capable of teaching uh, the things that are important to us. So we just finished both classes for this year, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to continue that next year. And on the lower right, we have typical the visitors to the area, mostly uh, summertime tourists who want to come to Yellowstone, and we have a captive audience. They have to stop here, and we give them a, a short lecture on what happened. So that works out. That's our program. That's how we keep the facility going and uh, keep the interest going. Next year. So Cody and Paul today, I, when we built that facility uh, 10 years ago, I, I went up and down Cody and looked in the windows, just like I did back in 1944. And here are the signs that I saw. Next year. Welcome, Japanese American. Every store window on Cody had that sign. Very, very nice gesture. People of Cody are totally different than they were back in 44. Next chart. I'm going to close down with a couple of snapshots of my buddies. Here's Kobe. Uh, most of us went to Berkeley. I went to college, and, and many of us went to Berkeley. Uh, Kobe became a pharmacist. Others became professionals, you know, doctors and attorneys. And, and, uh, and our parents were really encouraging us to get a good education, so that worked out well. Uh, and next, next chart. Yeah, there's Kobe, uh, more of a recent picture. And, and uh, he still looks the same. He did a, a great job uh, in uh, becoming a pharmacist. Next chart. Uh, Willie, uh, Willie Ito, famous uh, uh, buddy of ours. Uh, he decided not to go to college. He wanted to become the world's best cartoon artist. And, uh, and that's OK if you're really good. So but Willie went to an art school in uh, Los Angeles. And he learned how to make cartoons. And uh, he, he was quite good. And uh, next chart, uh, he was hired by Walt Disney. Uh, and and uh, he uh, uh, did very well and, and uh, elevated in position. He became the head of their quality control to make sure all the people who make Disney products make the quality. Uh, by the way, that doll he's making, notice Mickey Mouse is a frown. That doll was made in Mexico. <laughs> And Willie was sent down to teach them, Mickey doesn't frown, he smiles. <laughs> but as he has that doll in his house, by the way. Uh, and so, um, uh, Willie is, is our darling. But I want, you to, I want you to see this video clip, the next one here. So let's play it. Lady in the Tramp. Well, have you seen Lady in the Tramp? Oh, yeah. Willie yeah. did that. Willie is the artist for Lady in the Tramp. Oh. Amazing skill. And some of, the, oh, some of his artworks, by the way, is on display at the exhibit. Uh, so be sure to uh, have an opportunity to get one of those. Uh, but yeah, Willie was our artist. He wanted to be here, by the way. Yesterday he decided he couldn't go. He had surgery a few weeks ago and it wasn't working out well, so he had to stay oh, home. Yeah. Uh, but he would have been here. He'll be here next year, so he. Uh, he promises no surgery before pilgrimage. <laughs> Next chart. Oh, what happened to uh, Toshi Ito? Remember the uh, 
young a lady with a um, unfortunate situation with the father. Well, she had a family, young Master Ito in the front. You'll recognize him. Here's the next picture. Judge Lance oh, Ito of the O.J. Oh. Simpson trial. Now, I see Lance once in a while. He's a nice guy outside the courtroom. But <laughs> Lance is a good fellow. Next chart. Uh, I was interested in math and science in high school and uh, uh, at the, at the urge, encouragement of uh, Shirley Higuchi's brother, uh, uncle, uh, he, uh, he recommended I uh, pursue an engineering career, and I went to Berkeley, I went to UCLA grad school, and hired by the Boeing company, and uh, helped develop rockets, and went to the moon, and rockets that put up satellites, like the, the rocket that you see here. And I really enjoyed it. Terrific, 42 years, I couldn't ask for a better career. And so when I retired, that's what I got into doing what I'm doing today, which is to help educate people all over the world. Next chart. Oh, what happened to the poster girl, the um, image of, uh, of Dor Dorothea Lang? Well, she, uh, she still looks the same. Here's a photograph, a more recent one. Next chart. Uh, that's her on the left. Uh, the eyes are the same. The nose is the same. She calls it a Japanese nose. <laughs> and uh, she changed her name twice. Her first name used to be... Hidano, Japanese name, and she changed it to Helene, easier to pronounce. Her last name used to be Nakamoto, Nakamoto from the Yamaguchi Ken. And she changed that to, next chart, Mihara. We've been married for 65 years. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Helene doesn't remember Dorothea taking her pictures until one of her relatives saw uh, the Dorothea Lang photo at, uh, at the Smithsonian. And she called her. And we flew back and saw, yeah, that was her. And so that's how she found out about the, uh, the photo. Next chart. So I'm going to conclude why these prison camps exist. Next chart. That was racial prejudice. The media causing hatred. Next chart. The hysteria, you know, billboards, you know, and headlines mm. driving the local readers to do something about this. There was economic greed. Some of the farmers, the farmers, uh, uh, unions have recommended removal of the Japanese competition mm -hmm. that drove greed into having us removed. And the last and most important, some leaders who failed us. So when you have that combination of these, that's when the problem begins. Next chart. And it could have happened to other people. Remember I talked about all the Germans and Italians? Yeah, it could have been them. More recently, after 9-11, you remember Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, turned out to be a, a Muslim American, and there were calls for people of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Muslim American communities to be removed, just like they did with the Japanese. And more recently, there was a, a minister in Florida who recommended imprisonment of all gays and lesbians in this country. And in a sense, the imprisonment of today's immigrant families from Central America. I've been to several of these prisons all over the U.S. and interviewed some of the people and the conditions are really bad, especially for prisons for children. So there's got to be a better solution than what we're doing right now. So the point is, you know, it could have been you know, your families, it could have been others like your friends, next chart. That could be your son looking at this guard, worried, where is he taking me, next chart. This could be your daughter inside the prison asking, when am I going to get out of here after three years? And then last chart, the son trying to climb out, not knowing there's a guard with a weapon pointing straight at him. And so I simply say, next chart, never again to anyone at all, never again. Well, that concludes my formal portion of the, of the talk. I'm going to uh, wind up with a couple of announcements next chart. Uh, I wrote a book called Blindsided, it's available at the uh, exhibit area, um, and it has a lot more details about uh, the difficult and the fun times, and I frankly have to admit, I had a few fun times about the life in the prison. Um, and also, next short, uh, oh, we did a CD, uh, uh, actual DVD, uh, a team of us who have been in the, the prison system, and uh, that's also available. Uh, this is a video coverage of uh, talks that we gave uh, all over the uh, Los Angeles uh, area. Next chart. And uh, final comment, if any of you know of anyone who um, might be interested in our talks, uh, 
uh, come up and pick up one of my cards, and, and, and I'd be happy to send them information about uh, my plans for the year, and uh, if I could possibly include uh, your communities or your schools or, or other groups that you might know. Please uh, let me know, pick up a card, and, and I'll be happy to take care of that. So with that, uh, last chart, my title chart, uh, we have time for a few questions. Uh, anyone have any questions at all? Yeah, go ahead in the front. Were, were teachers and medical staff incarcerated too, or were they brought outside? Of the, uh, the teachers? And the medical staff. Oh, the medical staff. Uh, all of the, no, a large majority of the teachers were local, uh, were residents of the camp. Residents of the camp. The problem was there weren't enough certified teachers to teach. And uh, so the government hired 33 white teachers to come to the camp. They live with us. They have their own, their own building. Oh. When you go up the hill, there's a little tiny building on the right side. Uh, that's a typical of the housing that the teachers had. Oh. And so they, they lived inside the camp with us, yeah. And uh, uh, so that was the teaching. The medical staff were, uh, uh, well, yeah, all of them were uh, residents. They, these were mostly general practitioner Japanese uh, doctors. Uh, and, you know, I have to admit, they were good at delivering babies. We had about 330 <laughs> babies born, uh, including Kathy Yule. Kathy's not here today, but you'll see her. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, we had. Uh, Babies born, we had broken bones mended, appendicitis uh -huh. taken care of, but no eye doctor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, next one. Yeah, go ahead. Were there any legal cases uh, against the government after the war for unconstitutional uh, basis? Oh, yeah. Uh, the the uh, Cormosu case continued Was that after the war. Uh, after, the after the war, yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, even though it was decided uh, before the end of the war, uh, there were reviews of that case by uh, the Supreme Court. And, and finally, about a, a few years ago, I forget the date, um, it was finally reversed uh, after all reversed. those years. And the same for, um, uh, well, the Endo case ended it. You know, that was it. So there's no question it was unconstitutional. Uh, there was only one Supreme Court, Supreme Court case or many? Was there more than the, oh, well, the third? The, you know, there were two more. Uh, Hirabayashi was one of them. Gordon Hirabayashi from uh, Seattle, uh, and that was also found guilty. <laughs> and um, uh, who was the third one? The lawyer from Portland. What's that? Oh, Yasui. Yeah, yeah. Men Yasui. He was a real activist. He he went out in the streets, demanded to be arrested so he could challenge. He was a lawyer. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, those are the three famous cases mm -hmm. that yeah. came up. Anyone else have a question? Yes. Yes, uh, my father uh, left camp. Yeah. He, he had um, two children and a wife, and he left camp to find a job. Because the way I understand, if you can find a job, you could leave, leave camp and then come back and get your family. And I just wondered how many people did that or how... Yeah, you know, the question is, uh, uh, she understood there were people who left the camp to go to work yeah. uh, and come back after the... Uh, to uh, get their family, to family. Uh, there's, a, there's a condition on that. Yes, it was allowed. The condition was you don't go west. Condition was you had to go east. Uh, and so uh, what happened was um, uh, uh, we had some help from the outside. Uh, people who wanted to have us live a better life and uh, they found jobs for us and a lot of people about I would say about maybe 10% of the people found jobs back east and they moved out but 90% of us decided to stay and you know, let the government take care of us uh, but like, uh, like I said it was only one way you had to go east but you know you had no jobs you'd have no friends you know why would you want to go back east and have a difficult time. So a lot, most of us didn't go. Yeah. In the back, go ahead. What was your impression of the camp when you first arrived at camp? Right. Uh, did you come by railroad? Because I see the tracks right by the. Yeah, the, the track you crossed over, uh, you will cross over tomorrow, uh, is the track that we came on. Uh, and uh, yeah, we rode that from California, it's, you know, railroad. That's the only way to get here, to move that many people. In, in a short amount of time. Uh, each train had about 600 people. And so, yeah, they had a lot of trains, passenger trains, converted to prisons. Yeah. 
Absolutely. When you first saw the camp. Okay. Where, when you first saw the camp building, you know, when you got oh, yeah. the yeah, yeah, yeah. The train stopped on the siding and we got on the backs of trucks and went through the main gate and then we saw the barracks. Yeah, yeah. It's like going up that little hill that you'll see tomorrow and uh, seeing that plateau with all the barracks. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Anyone else? Yes, in the back. Um, you mentioned people escaping. You mentioned people escaping. Oh! <laughs> I escaped. <laughs> Some of my buddies also escaped. We were tired of living inside the fenced area, and so what we did, the, when the guards were not looking, we would sneak out and spread the barbed wire fence and go down to the river. Always came back before sunset. So that's why I say it was a temporary escape. But no one escaped uh, permanently. Uh, and and it, if you think about it, geographically, it was a, it was almost an ideal location because it was 300 miles to the uh, main terminal in Cheyenne. And everyone who saw us on the road trying to get a hitchhike knew who we were, so it was impossible to, to pass you know, as a uh, non-prisoner. So that's, you know, and they had these passes that made everyone who had official reason to leave, uh, to go to Cody and, uh, and do some shopping, we had a, a day pass and it said, on this day you're allowed to go to Cody, but you must return by sunset. You had to show that to anyone who asked you. That's the system they used, yeah. Yes? I'm wondering about when Pearl Harbor was bombed. What was, what was how did the Marines know that Pearl Harbor what you remember or your family's reaction was. Uh, I, I can't imagine you would have ever assumed this would happen, but what was your initial reaction when Pearl Harbor? Yeah, the, the, the question had to be about the reaction of the families. Um, yeah, what, what Donna talked about yesterday was very, very familiar. Um, most of our parents, um, born in Japan, raised in Japan, and they were taught in Japan, don't complain about what the government decides. Uh, don't challenge the government. If the government says move, you move. And that's what they were taught. So that's why people of the older second generation, like Korematsu and Yasui and Hirabayashi, knew better. And they were trained to know better, and so that's why they resisted. But uh, our parents didn't resist, they just went along with it. And you know, that was a very difficult problem. But the, the parents also realized that it was a difficult situation when we got home. And, and you know, to face the racism and, and the problems that we went back home, that's when they figured out the only solution is to get a good education. So our parents really, really drove it into us to, to do whatever it's needed to get a good education. Fortunately, you know, all of my friends, most of my friends went to Berkeley. And we did, we did okay. Anyone else? Yes? Were you able to return to your home? It yeah. seems like you were able to return to your neighborhood, but were you able to return to your original home? Uh, I didn't hear the full question. Could, could you repeat what you said? Yeah, did you return to your, your home? Oh, okay. Yeah, in our case, uh, we were very, very fortunate. My father knew a, uh, a white attorney in San Francisco. Uh, and became friends with him for a long time before uh, we were removed. And uh, they took care of our house. Very, very fortunate. Um, and they rented it out, service a mortgage until we got home. But that was not the case with most other people. And they lost their homes. And they couldn't find a buyer or forced to sell at a very, very low price. So, yeah, that was a difficult time for most people. Yeah. Uh, one more question in the back, yes. I just want to comment on your presentation. The use of prisoners, because I haven't heard that. Usually you always hear, oh, I went to camp, which kind of sounds like a happy camping days and stuff like that. <laughs> so I think that, you know, for today, you know, when I talk to people, I don't say internment camp, I'll say concentration camp. So I'm just, you know, uh, acknowledging your use of the word prisoners because I haven't heard that yeah. before. And I think all of us should take that back and share it. This was not a choice for people. Yeah. You know, prisoners like you're taken against your will. Yeah. You know, so, you know, continue. And and for us in the audience to, to you know, remember. You know, but I would get upset when I see pe people's pictures right. on camp and they're all smiling because they're showing the little Boy Scouts or yeah. the picnic or the dance.
Yeah, yeah, that reminds me uh, about terminology. Um, I have a preferred set of terminology. Certainly relocation camp is not accurate. And on the other extreme, the use concentration camp. Uh, I really don't like to use that phrase uh, because I've spoken to many audiences, including Holocaust museums, and I'm sensitive to, to that group of people who are sensitive about the phrase concentration camp. And to imply that we had anything close to a, a Holocaust camp is, is not correct. And I don't want to leave that impression. So I, I don't feel I don't feel bad calling it a prison. You know, technically we were in a prison. The guards ordered to shoot if necessary to hold us in. That's a prison. But uh, but uh, no, I prefer and I hate the relocation camp. Uh, and uh, I, I really don't like to use uh, internment. That's not accurate either. That's for military prisoners and uh, prisoners of war. So I like to use uh, either prison or incarceration camp. Mm -hmm. Last question. How, how did you survive the winter? I mean, you got here. Oh, about people, the winters. Yeah. How did you yeah, get yeah. clothes and blankets and all that? Very interesting. The government, in hindsight, um, ordered warmest clothing available from their stockpile when they saw the winter coming. And they consisted of navy pea coats. You ever seen a navy pea coat? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Real heavy, yeah. thick wool. Mm -hmm. The problem was they were designed for adult. <laughs> At nine years old, he would be dragging on the floor. And so the problem was how to get the young people um, some good clothing, reasonable clothing. and. Uh, it turns out um, a Sears catalog was the answer. So we had everybody seemed to wear the same clothes uh, from Sears catalog. And uh, I remember my boots. My my mother was very very had a difficult time ordering what size of shoes I should wear. Uh, my feet were growing, so she decided to buy my shoes, my boots, winter boots, two sizes bigger. I looked like a clown walking around town. I didn't want to wear my boots, but I remember that. It was they all looked the same. Sears catalog boots. You know, so did you boots. have to buy them or did they just provide them? No, no, we had to buy them. To there was a small allowance, I recall a number like twelve dollars a month for clothing allowance, uh, for those people who really needed it, you know. Uh, so uh, no, that's how we were able to survive the, the winters. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all. A reminder again, uh, my books are out in the bookstore. Um, pick up a card if you know of anyone who would like to hear about uh, my story in your hometowns. And uh, enjoy your stay. I look forward to coming.